Okay, folks, good morning. Go do something a little bit different, and hopefully a little bit more successful than last night. And uh, we're going to work on uh, some 20 mil stuff. Move this stuff out of the way here. That doesn't need to be there. tried to do some of this last night and it was not very successful I was very tired and I had a few people on but no interaction so that promptly put me to sleep <laughs> and didn't help that the night before I'd only gotten like four hours of sleep I don't know if the interaction would have actually helped Okay, let's get our wet palette out of here. And uh, only color should be out here is just German gray, and we don't need any for right now. German gray and white. Because I think we painted everything in the German gray overall. And there's already a, originally a coat of this stuff on it before. Good morning, Dirk. Welcome to the 20th century. So there's parts on here we're going to do, like there's a little muffler covering that just has like some, um, it has like a perforated thing. That's usually almost always rust colored. We're just worried about the gray color at this point. I just want to make sure that pretty much everything got an even coat of it before we go and do some highlighting on it. And if you weren't on here yesterday, which I wouldn't imagine that you would have been because you would have been sound asleep, but <clears throat> this is an old 20 millimeter kit from a company called Rafam, R-A-F-M. I don't, actually, I don't know if they were ever pronounced. We always called them Rafam. And um, I believe they were from Canada. And some of their stuff is, uh, you know, they're wargaming models. So, like, for instance, this turret looks like it's a little flatter than normal. Just a tiny bit, maybe by 10%, maybe 5 Um but I've had this I've had this little guy for probably since the early 90s and done nothing with him and um, actually I've been playing a little bit a little bit of armored commander which is a Patton's best type of game that someone created and I was playing a Barbarossa campaign and it just so ha happened that I got handed this vehicle well, I started I played it a little bit before, and then I believe yesterday morning, maybe the day before, um, I got assigned a a uh, SDKFZ 221. So not even did I get a 20 millimeter cannon. I get an armored car, a four wheel armored car with an MG34, just one of them. So I survived about three days, and I got taken out by I want to say a T28 or something like that. You basically would engage guys. Hopefully, you get some support, you know, and um, and play keep away. But I got knocked out. Guy got killed. Started another career. Same thing, Barbarossa. Same thing, random assignment tank. Get get one of these. Out of coincidental coincidentally, these guys are a lot more successful than than a vehicle that's armed with only a single machine gun. <laughs> Go figure. Still a pretty weak vehicle, but mainly because of the um, mainly because of the uh, the armament, not necessarily the armor. The armor on this thing isn't really much worse than I, I believe it's actually better than than um, 
than the Russian light tanks, which isn't saying a whole lot. But it is the it is the final version of the Panzer II that saw wide service, because there was a Panzer II L, but it didn't show up until like 1944 in very 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 limited numbers, and I think only like three or four different units even got them. And it's pretty much a heavy recon vehicle. Panzer II Lukes. And um, this was the, this is as good as the Panzer II's really got. You know, if you're talking the main battle tank versions, because they did have a Flampanzer, which was a very strange vehicle called the Flamingo. And there was very few numbers of those. This actually was, at some point, I had sprayed this with Panzer Gray. And more than likely, it was probably sprayed in the Panzer Gray that came in a spray can from Model Master. The Model Ma I'm not a fan of spray cans using them for paints, um, but Model Master actually had a really good Panzer Yellow too in a spray. And. Um, They, um, and I used that way back in the day. Way back when. All right, so let's go ahead and lighten this up a little bit. Let's get... This side, I can't remember which side has the more of the content. No, it was that one. Just a lot of it is evaporated. All right, there's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of material in there. So let's take this. But I've been wanting to paint some 20 millimeter stuff. I want to get I wanted to paint a vehicle, and I also want to try one vehicle versus one vehicle in the skirmish rules that I have because I've read through them I have not seen practically what it is and um, I didn't want to go and buy a vehicle you know I don't have a, a short barreled Panzer 3 versus a T26 which I also don't have or something like that but um, I figured this should be pretty easy to paint I've got a couple of Russian vehicles that would face off against this thing pretty well. I gotta familiarize myself with these rules eventually again. Um, I've actually never played with the vehicles. I've read the rules and, and liked the rules for the vehicles. I've played with the infantry. The infantry play is solid. But. All right. Let's, I guess let's do the turret first. And I don't want to just play with the vehicles not painted. What's the freaking point in that? <laughs> let's see if this is too much of a contrast. No, I don't think so. So I'm going to follow the same stages that I saw some other folks do this online and what I did in my other two vehicles, which is you paint the overall color overall, you give it some highlighting, um, then you give it a brown wash, you know, you paint all the tires and stuff, we got to paint all the tires black and, you know, um, or, or a little bit rubber colored, and then we give it a, a brown wash overall. 
and then we give it a black wash in certain places and then do some dirt then we do some highlighting some dirt uh, some dirt uh, in certain places and that's it it should be done and it, I've been really happy with how the other the other vehicles turned out you know and these are ugly ugly castings and they turned out really well I think so and I have mixed feelings about putting vehicles on on basis but I I tend to go with them because you can put them in the ter in a terrain so they kind of look you know like they're part of the terrain that they're in and um, and also you put a magnet on it so you can you bring them from point A to point B they're not falling all over themselves it's somewhere in between the two I don't remember if I have any German decals for the for this particular vehicle. I don't think I do, but we can scrounge up some turret numbers. The Balkan Kreutz, we can uh, we can paint on itself. They're very small and they're on the hull on this vehicle, so. Just wanted to do something a little bit different that wasn't a damn a hun. <laughs> oh wait, aren't these guys huns too? <laughs> Just in the first world war. We're not doing airbrushing. We're not doing modulation. We're not doing that crap. I don't have time for to fool with an airbrush. Nor desire. This is poor man's airbrushing here. This thing's heavy as shit too. When you're used to painting those little 15 millimeter miniatures, or actually the elephant is really heavy. The elephant I just finished is a pretty heavy piece. Good morning, Ian. Yeah, I just thought about that, you know, talking about Peyton 100 or the next. They had a worse nickname. 
You guys had a worse nickname for the Germans in the First World War than in the second one, and they certainly deserved a worse nickname in the second one than the first one. Think about that for a while. I don't really think of the Germans as the bad guys in the First World War. But definitely the second one. Maybe not on the Eastern Front. They're both the bad guys, but... I may actually have to paint this with my glasses because it's almost like I'm too close to the damn thing. Let's do something a little different. Got my face all up in this Nazi tank. so much somewhere in between the two the one thing is is this is super forgiving now, the first thing I just noticed after I jacked this chair up is man my I'm bending over I'm bending down a lot to look at this and I'm not worried necessarily about the little black around this thing. We're going to give this a, a black wash. It's going to bring all that in. I'm just adding some variations of gray. And like I said, I'm not getting into the airbrushing and modulation and zenithal and all that nonsense, all those big words. I've been to college. I don't need to use those big words. Actually, modulation is not a big word. That zenithal is, though. I did that only one time on the, on the, um, on that dinosaur that I have, and I don't know that it made that much of a difference. I haven't painted a 20 millimeter tank since the mid 70s. Yeah, I've had this thing probably since about 1992 and done nothing with it. And it's high freaking time. <laughs> it's high freaking time. It's weird to use significantly more amounts of paint. Well, actually, now I'm using it. Before, I just wasted it. Twenty millimeters, like somebody called it, the one true scale. I got into this scale for skirmish because 
at the time every vehicle was about was available lots of stuff available for stuff in this scale I never I never was a 28 millimeter guy never and probably never will be a 28 millimeter guy sorry Dirk they just take too long to paint and I can't use 20 mil for everything because you know they're useless for ancients there's a company called a couple of companies that make them what what new line designs I think or something like that But other than that, I got into this scale because of the availability of vehicles. You know, I started playing with 76 millimeter, you know, the 76 millimeter, 176 scale airfix stuff. So it was a natural progression. So some people like got into Warhammer and then continued on 28. Same thing. I continued on, you know, basically what I was, uh, um, what I started as a kid, which was 172nd scale stuff. It was natural for me to progress. God, this thing is heavy. This is extremely heavy. <laughs> I'm going to build up my wrist working on this stuff. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I guess that's, I guess that's my natural progression is to my love for this scale was because of, you know, the fond memories that I had as a kid. No, I'm not going to go crazy. It's not going to be super highlighting because there's no point in putting a ton of work into it. And then you end up giving it a wash and, and, and it all disappears. So we can always highlight a little bit later after the wash is on it. This is just to give it so it's not all one. I could have just skipped this step really. I honestly don't remember if I did that on the Russian vehicles. And, and these things photograph really well and they look great in person. But I'm not really sure how they come out on video. But these things, I was really impressed how they turned out. And I mean, I hadn't painted, I hadn't painted one of these things. And these are the first vehicles I painted that were worth a damn. So, you remember when Matchbox started doing tank kits? Up until then, we only had Airfix kit, but the range was very limited. Was the Airfix stuff 176th? I'll be honest with you, I mix the two. As long as you don't use the same vehicle as both, you're okay. I got some of each. I got some of each. I like the Matchbox stuff as a kid because when you're a kid, you didn't paint. Um, and it already came in colors. So, I know that this, that doesn't mean anything by, you know, for today's standards, but... All right, we have enough of that basic color, so we need to paint wheels, tracks, etc. So let's um, let's get a brush that we can kind of count on. We didn't get Airfix here, kits here. They were called MPC. I, I don't know why, but I mean, you can get them now. But when I was a kid in the 80s in the States, you did not get, you did not get Airfix branded stuff here. I don't know whether it was a copyright issue or some nonsense. They were the same kits though. I call them Airfix kits with better box art because the box art was great. MPC had some awesome box art for their war models. I mean, it was um, captivating, you know? That was my go-to model company, was MPC.
But unfortunately, they had very few Russian things. Your main interest was the Western Desert. I love the Western Desert. And I remember the excitement when Matchbox released their Panzer II and Panzer III. Airfix Matchbox 176. Some Italian and Japanese kits were 172nd. Fujimi was one, which Fujimi, which was one seven, was 176 as well. Hasegawa was 72nd. Um, Eshi stuff was 170, 172nd. That's the Italian guys. Which some of those kits apparently are really expensive, or or they go for a lot of money, whether or not people are willing to pay for them for that. I always hated their infantry. I always hated Eshi infantry. They were they were blanky, weird shaped, like, hey, what's the this war? You know, they just weird looking dudes. Yeah, mix eight eighty seventh and yeah, Roco mini tanks. Roco mini tanks. Had that big fold out catalog. Big Roco mini tanks fold out catalog. And they made all kinds of vehicles that never saw action they made a lot of like weird because they made a lot of modern stuff which I didn't give two shits about they made like a Panzer IV I got one of them rolling around it's a piece of crap <laughs> it's just very small and, and, and not well done and um I think I got a Sherman or something like that. But if I remember correctly, Roco Mini Tanks was West German, right? So they had, you know, vehicles from the 50s and 60s in the West, in the Bundeswehr, like the Rock and schlepper and shit like that that's useless if you're doing World War II stuff. Of course, that was like when I was 12 or 13, so, you know, sometimes you don't know any better. You see some vehicle with a German name on it, like, a, it, it, must, it must be a member of the Panzerwaffe. What else would it be, right? And then you, and then you get it, and then you find out that you, you have a vehicle that just was never used in World War II, you know. Oh, well. The mistakes you make as children. Well, I'm just using straight black, and it's fading nicely to a rubber color because it's watered down a little bit. Because people make a big deal. Don't use black for, don't use black to, for rubber on, on tires. Well, if you're going to weather it, yeah, use black. Or, you know, mine's thin down a little bit for flow. Let's get this over here. Like, I didn't have any Russian infantry from, from Airfix. I don't remember ever seeing them from MPC. I just don't remember seeing them. And that's my two favorite theaters, is the Western Desert. The problem with Western Desert is you just have issues with the infantry. You know, it's not, they got to play uh, hideaway during the daytime. You know, the, the desert isn't, the desert isn't completely flat, but there also isn't a, a ton of terrain for infantry to hide in. So, 
Uh, the Western Desert's interesting to me because, you know, both sides are, are particularly interesting, both on the equipment that they used. Um, they're a good match for each other. You know, the cruiser tanks are, I think, beautiful looking, especially the Crusaders. I don't give a shit how often they broke down or, you know. But I just think they're a very attractive tank. And, uh, you know, there's... Lots to like about the Africa Corps. And I think they're, they're a good match for each other. Skelters originally due to model railways. British model railroad was OO and US and European HO. When I was six, my dad brought me my first boxes of Airfix figures, World War I Germans and World War II Russians. He wasn't strong on historical accuracy. Yeah, I, don't, I never cared for those World War I German figures. They, um... I had some of them. I had some of, uh... I had some of them. I never cared for them. I always thought that the little the little field caps that the World War One Germans used were always really stupid looking. I always thought they were really dumb looking. Just a little flat front. They didn't when you were six. My dad was always pro buying me war war toys. Um, I wasn't one of those people like, you can't play with toy guns. Oh yeah, I could. I couldn't dress up as anything scary or monsters or shit like that when I was a kid. But you know, military crap, oh yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Just watched an episode of... Um a guy that I'm subscribed to, and I don't really watch much of his stuff, even though I really like him, but I forget that I like him, and that's Lindy Beige. Because Lindy Beige is delivery. I, I, I think he's really funny. I think he's really, really funny. And he speaks really clearly. Because some people do not speak clearly. All right, how are we going to do this? Let me think about this. Let's prop this up on something, but something that won't F it. You know what I need to do? That's what this bloody thing's for. I forget I have this thing. It's really useful, especially for something like this. Um, I was watching a thing on Lindy Beige about the German half tracks, and I thought it was really, really good. I mean, it's not something that I need to, that I don't really know about. It just, I wanted something in the background. And, um, you know, he kind of worked it into where he used to build models as a kid. And I like the part where he didn't fall for, you know, where they would replace, they would replace U.S. half tracks to pretend to be German ones and, He's actually historic on one year. I didn't get to see him, but he has a lot of energy. So I, I appreciate people that are that really are into history or war gaming or military history that have a lot of energy. <clears throat> he doesn't really drone on.
He grew up watching old war films on TV, playing with toy soldiers. Becoming a war gamer was inevitable. Yep. What was the war film that you watched the most as a kid? I would imagine that in England, I'm sorry, Britain, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> um, I've got nothing against the Welsh, even though I say England when I mean Britain. Um... What's the war film? It, you know, what I was going to say is it's probably the same thing as when I grew up. You, you watched whatever was on television. So uh, you might have wanted a CA, but you only got the CB. What was, your, what was the war film that you watched as a kid the most often? And it might have been, you know, just what they played. I, I would avoid anything black and white. So I've never seen The Longest Day all the way through. I think I started watching it one time. I just couldn't take it anymore. just don't want to see World War II. I don't, I don't want to see a World War II movie in black and white. I could just watch World War II footage then that's in black and white and it's the real thing. Um... The one I watched more than any other, easily. Have I watched History Squad's videos? A bit lower energy than Lindy, but he has tons of reenacting prop and uses minis to demonstrate tactics. Nope, but I'm going to I'm going to write him down on my homework assignment sheet. And good morning to you, Ben. Yeah, the first time I came across Lindy, I'm like, who's this poor... S Who's this poor guy that needs a date with a comb? And then, but I really like him. I think he's uh, history squad. History squad. Um, one thing that's important to to American viewers is you get somebody on there that. Well, it's not so important anymore because there's subtitles everywhere, but there's some people that are really hard to understand. Like if you watch the guys with the... Um, the tank museum, the guys that do the tank museum, a couple of guys are easy to, interest, to, to listen to. The short guy with a mustache, maybe it's because his mustache is so big. You got to really pay attention. Oh, I really have to pay attention to what what he's saying. So he just have a he just has a heavier accent wherever that accent is from. Uh, I'm not an expert on those things. I know my accents here in the United States, not necessarily the oh that he's from Birmingham or you know what have you. The other guy that I, I used to listen to and I used to like a lot, even though he's a bit over the top. Oh, I can never want to remember what his name is. It's the guy that used to, you know, hide a win with, you know, swords or whatever. Uh, used to be on the History Channel. I can't remember what he is. The bald-headed dude. Anyways, he's he has a lot of energy, too. I can't remember what his name is because he has a very, he has a name that doesn't really go with him. It's not British enough. <laughs> oh, I was, I, I, I was reading that great game book and I come across some guy and, and as soon as I hear his last name, his surname, I'm like, now there's a British last name. I can't remember what it was, but it was, you know. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have the same thing. You have preconceptions of what American things are. Mine could be misguided, but, you know.
Uh, probably Damn Busters, which is the most iconic World War II movie as far as Brits are concerned. Never seen it. Obviously, I know what it's about. You know. Lancaster Bombers. Those damn busters. For me, easily, Guns and Navarone. I've seen that movie more than any of the other ones. Mm -hmm. And the crappy Battle of the Bulge one, because they played it, you know. But I didn't learn my history from it. It's not like I thought, oh, that's exactly how it went down. Just those are definitely one and two. I don't think I ever saw Bridge Too Far as a kid. They just didn't play it. I never saw um, The Eagle Has Landed as a kid. I like that movie. That's a great movie. Um, that's actually like several movies. Built in one. Oh yeah, Cross of Iron. They used to play that one. Some. They would edit the, um, the BJ scene. Which I actually didn't even know that they had it in it as, as, until an adult. Bridge over the River Kwai. Started watching it, just it just wasn't about what I wanted a, a war movie to be about, right? It's all like being prisoners. So I think I've seen part of it. And we didn't have choices, you know. You just watch wherever they played. I did not gravitate towards U.S. stuff. I, I, I never could understand the, oh, the World War II started in 1941. <laughs> That's not this guy. No. I didn't see Battle of Britain until three months ago. Didn't avoid it. I just never got around to seeing it. You know, and after you're an adult and you're a World War II nut, you don't need to see a, a movie that's, you know, not going to be accurate. Never really liked POW movies. Yeah, me too. They used to show The Great Escape all the time, and I've never seen it because it's a POW movie. If I want to see something about POWs, I will, I will watch Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> and I did a lot of it with my dad. <laughs> but... Um, And I never cared for stuff in the Pacific. Never did. The one thing that struck me really strange when I watched Battle of Britain three months ago, you know, it showed both sides and it was really weird. It was very dated to show even more than watching 55 Days of Peking, which I also watched in the last three months for the first time. You know how they used to do the, well, that's an old movie, like 1955, right? And all the Chinese parts were played by, you know, Europeans. That's strange now. It was even stranger in Battle of Britain showing the Germans as all hunky-dory and 
you know, the martial music and they did that stuff. Just like, oh, it's just another sign of the coin. It's just really weird to to see that now. Um, really, really weird. <laughs> We're used to seeing war movies that are a little dirtier for both sides. And certainly not paint the not paint the Germans as just like, oh, they're just out having a parade and they just have different helmets. Never watch a World War II movie with the word escape in the title. The Great Escape, Escape to Victory, Escape to Athena. Oh, Escape to Athena is terrible. I couldn't watch it. And I'm a, I'm a big Niven and Roger Moore fan. I pretty much will watch anything those two are in. But between Elliot Gould in it, which drives me bananas, I cannot stand him. He just, he's like adding, he's like adding somebody who just doesn't belong in any movie he's in. I couldn't stand Escape to Athena. Just weird, like, who thought of this abortion? <laughs> I, I forget I have this thing. This thing is so useful. Well, that's why it's called Helping Hands. Yeah, Escape to Athena is terrible. What's the other one? Escape to Victory? I haven't heard that one. Yeah. I've heard good things of Sahara. Never watched it. I don't like Bogart. I just, I don't like them. I can't like everybody. Jeez. Saw Sink the Bismarck several times. My only complaint with it, other than being black and white, duh, is it just focuses on stuff that's, you know, not the most interesting thing. I thought the ship models were pretty good, especially at the time. It's a great escape every Christmas. Is it a Christmas movie? Huh. Never seen it. Is Sinatra in that one? Or I'm thinking Von Ryan's Express that I've never seen also. Um, it's really easy to confuse movies you've never seen together <laughs> with each other. I don't think I've ever seen a movie with Frank Sinatra in it. I have to admit, I'm not a big movie person. It is in the UK. Okay. Is that where you grew up, Dirk, and then you and then they kicked you out to that little island or Islands, sorry, there's more than one island in New Zealand. Okay, I think I need to do the suspension underneath here. Those little suspension things. Let's see. Um, let me look for a picture of this Panzerkampfwagen. See, even with all the books I have, I just automatically go to the internet. It's just 
my normal reaction to go and um, Pansa two. dry or whatever it's called I don't speak German I speak Blitzkrieg German I know all my I know all my germ I'm my uh, wargaming German <laughs> oh man where is we need Sapanza 2 I believe that is those um oh it doesn't necessarily have to be painted i'm going to paint it it's those uh leaf spring things it's the leaf springies von ryan is a sinatra movie okay yeah i've seen it Just don't have the options that we back then you watched whatever they put on the TV let's water this down some more or thin this down some more need to be completely black just just some oily shit and yeah it could end up being rusty and stuff in there but you can take things too far we can do that at a later step I want that to be just a, a darker color than the rest of it just fooling around with something different today I gotta be careful. I don't end up like the freaking hair and not finish the army. No. Main thing is knowing that you got that coming up. Just didn't feel like doing Huns today. Decided to do Krauts instead of Huns. Okay. I'm pretty sure I made my own mix for the tread. For the tracks. All right. That's where we go next. Escape movie that had Pele in it. Wow. Wish they'd make a mini series about the early SAS. I was listening to the audiobook about them in World War II, and those missions would make great movies. I don't know much about them. I assume you mean in the desert? I wish they made more stuff along the lines of Band of Brothers. You know, that wasn't so focused on. Like, I like World War II stuff. I never see myself buying U.S. paratroopers and painting them. just doesn't interest me. I'm not saying that I'm not saying certain contributions of certain soldiers weren't important. Um, it just doesn't interest me. You know? Uh, I'm not interested. I don't think the Japanese make a very good enemy. It doesn't mean that they didn't fight like demons. And if and the Pacific campaign wasn't important, I just doesn't interest me. You know? I don't think the Japanese are very interesting. I mean, Germans and Nazis in particular make excellent enemies. I mean, it's just it's just a fucking fact. I mean, you know, at least if you ask me. 
Doesn't get any better than that. This is what, Iron Warriors? Iron Warriors as opposed to Lead Belcher. Of course, we're going to tinker around with that. That's the darkest one. It's easier to lighten it. Yeah, it doesn't get any better than Nazis. You know, as enemies. Duh. taken out of context. I remember telling you saying he doesn't get any better than Nazis. He's a Nazi lover. Yeah. Sure I have. <laughs> As I like to say, they were sharp dressers and had cool toys. Other than that, everything about them sucked. <sighs> Masters of propaganda. I gotta be careful that I don't create a debacle for myself by having this here. I might just I'm gonna put that there and put it away. Sea of Sand. Oh, I never heard of that one. Good movie about the Long Range Desert Group. Never saw a raid on Rommel. Whiskey Galore. Audiobook is called SAS Great Escapes. It recounts escapes in Greece, Italy, North Africa, and Germany. Whiskey Galore what? And the SAS? I'm not picky. I like gin too. Gin's good. I'm not painting the underside of the track. Nobody's going to see that. And there's actually no detail on it. This is not a museum art piece of, of a casting. This is a wargaming model. Okay, there's the clamp that attaches the one side, and the one on the other one's missing. Now, 
we're going to paint it like there's nothing to see here. I was saying these tanks, you know, they're light tanks. The biggest problem that these things had, other than having a commander that was also the, 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 um, the gunner, honestly, their armor was pretty decent considering, you know, their weapon pretty much sucked. You know, but basically a recon vehicle. But the armor, it's just the F variant, didn't have any worse armor than, say, the Panzer threes that went into France did. Now, the Panzer twos that went into France were a little bit less armor than this one, but this thing's got like 30 millimeters of front armor. Well, that's the same as like a Panzer three E. Oh, there's a movie called Whiskey Galore. Interesting. They're almost essentially the same as Tobruk. Have I seen Tobruk? I don't think I have. And that's like criminal because I don't, well, they didn't play it. And I, you know, the inhabitants of the isolated Scottish island of Toddy. It's not today, right? Todd Day. In the outer, I've never had to say that word. Is it Hebrides? 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 Hebrides, I don't know, are largely unaffected by wartime rationing until 1943 when the supply of whiskey runs out. Oh, what your mainlanders do? You took our lifeblood away. You wrote a lot of sentence. You wrote a lot of words in a sentence that I don't know how to pronounce, and that's unusual for me. All of a sudden, I feel like Mitch. <laughs> Never heard of that island. Only Panzer II that I built, I mean, I had some in micro armor, was the Tamiya kit. Had one of those. And, and I'm honestly, I'm not going to paint the um, the 20 millimeter auto cannon in um, in gunmetal. I'm going to paint it the color of the tank. It just looks better. I've seen both done. I think it looks better being the color of the tank. You know, it probably wouldn't take long for that, th that paint to peel off of it, I would imagine. Pretty sure that, that barrel gets pretty hot. Auto cannon. That's magazine fed. I'm calling it an auto cannon.
paint some of the top here. All right, now we just need to do the front parts. I'm going to use a bigger brush than this. This one should be fine. Western Desert Films can be easily confused. James Mason played Rommel in both The Desert Fox and Desert Rats. Richard Burton was in both The Desert Rats and Ray on Rommel. I think Rommel's the only one of those that I've seen. I like James Mason, but he was like a, a pacifist, right? Let's get a pacifist to play a Nazi bastard. <laughs> hey, we want to cast you for a warmonger. Can you help us out here? <laughs> okay. Anything else? Got the little shovel. I'm not worried about the shovel at this point. Might as well paint the machine gun too while I'm at it. Not the auto cannon, the machine gun. And no, I don't. I don't like painting guns gray. I've seen other people do it. It looks good. I'm just scared. I got to be scared of something painting. That's one of them. Now, I don't remember if I sprayed gloss at this point. Before I gave it a wash when I did this last time. But I don't think I'm going to do it. That's just another step I don't need to do at this point. We'll do that towards the end. I guess we should paint that little thing. Right. That, that little muffler container is like the rustiest thing ever. There's like nothing that gets rustier than that. You can't find a picture of that thing not being totally encrusted with. We can do that afterwards. All right, let's give this a. An overall wash color and whatever this fantasy name thing is Agrax Earthshade. And I need to get something I don't ever use. Probably get this thing out of the way. We're not going to need this for this for a little while. See if I can find that thing I never use. 
Uh oh. There we go. Um, it's probably in the closet. Use the new one. Hopefully this is of a better material than those cheap paint palettes. You go to the store and buy those cheap paint palettes that cost maybe like a dollar or two dollars. I think, oh, those are really handy. But as soon as you use them once, you can't ever get the paint out of it. Um, it's almost like they're too porous a surface. So let's hope that's not the case on this one. If not, big deal. It came with it and I don't really need it. So... Um, Let's get the Agrax here. We could probably use something bigger than that. <gasps> We're gonna get to use big brushes? <gasps> oh, wow. felt like painting I felt like painting something different and I felt like painting something that I've got to paint anyway so I don't see any candidates here are they back here there's bigger ones here Because we are going to do a mix with the, we are going to mix up some resin with a lighter color to give give it the dusting. That's what I did with the other one. It turned out pretty well. This doesn't make a big difference, but it does in a whole great grand scheme of things. I'm probably going to just stick with this one. This one should be fine. A huge difference but I did see some metal flakes in there so let's not use this one that we used from with metal until we get a chance to clean it out really well I certainly have another one that's like that at least back here a lot of these I just have I haven't used or come on I want a square I wanted one of these square bladed ones that I hardly use for anything. But this one. There we go. She's good. All right. No fumbling. Maybe it wasn't metal flakes at all.
with the, um, not the thinner, what's it called? Okay, now I can't find the thing that's in my way. Anyways, the, the acrylic, the acrylic vehicle. You can take any color and, and turn it into this kind of a wash. Which we will do that when we get to the um, things that have to be rusty. I had a set of inks that were given to me a long time ago. I didn't find them very useful. And they were Games Workshop inks. This is super relaxing. I, I really like this. It's very forgiving. I don't like how this turned out. Okay, so repaint it, you know. And I'm not necessarily painting something that's got to be look ultra realistic, but just something to, I like, a, I like the war gamer look to it, you know, make it look a little bit like a comic book, like a nice comic book. The thing that I like to dislike the least about these Citadel colors, I I don't like their make-believe made-up names. You know, they make them hard to pronounce just for shits and giggles. They're, they're fluff names. What the hell's an Agrax? Look out, the Agrax are attacking. What tanks are used for the Germans in, in Tobruk? I might not want. I might not want to see it after all. <laughs> I might not want to see it after all. There's a couple films that do a pretty good job, I think, of doing mock-up German tanks. The what that Stalingrad movie. Enemy of the Gates, that one wasn't bad. The Russian films do a pretty good job. Even though I'd say the Russian films are probably more propaganda-like than the stuff that was made during World War II. You know, by the Allies, obviously not the ones made by the, by the Germans, but...
Which Tobruk is it? Is it the 41 Tobruk where they didn't take it? Or is it the 42 Tobruk where it did get taken? And my favorite naval theater is the, is the Mediterranean. I think the Mediterranean is super interesting. Of course, we've got black pin washing to do. As well. That's how I did the other ones. It, weren't, it wasn't too insanely detailed, but. that little rusty thing we'll come back and repaint that and rewash that little thing I don't want to get bogged down in the details at this point we can get that stuff later And I've done this stuff with like enamels. It's that's no need to go there. It's just a pain in the ass to deal with enamels. I'm not putting something in a museum. There's the there's the thing for the aerial. I don't think that I'm going to be adding those on there, it's not necessary.
see what that looks like on the screen. Nah, it's not even that noticeable on the screen. Okay, now let's do the top of the turret, which will the turret will not, which will have just lightly. I like this color. It's like a dirty, soot, sooty, you know. I wish they had these pre-made things back when I was doing um, naval miniatures instead of having to make my own and wonder why it looked great when I put it on and when it dried, I hate how it looked. But, you know, it was the 1990s. We didn't know any. We didn't know any better, so to speak. Now you can use a little bit of detergent and all those, all those tips and tricks you can use that are more readily available than they were back then, thanks to the internet. All right, we're gonna let this thing dry. Okay. Let's finish these two lads up. In this. Yeah, see, it, it gets stuck on here. Yeah, this tuck comes off a little bit better than the other one. What I need this for, see, I misremembered. This is what I need to use to mix that down. What's it called? Resin? Where is it? I think I hid it somewhere. It's always in my damn way. Glaze. Glaze is what I'm thinking of. Yeah, you put this stuff down, it's like milky white. You can add other colors to it and you're creating like a wash type of thing. All right. Uh, let's finish these guys up. U.S. Field Drab. Where's Iraqi Sand? This is my test refurb for my figures. I've got about 60 figures or so painted, which is plenty for what I need to do. Um, 
Let's see, Iraqi sand is probably this one right here. No, that's buff. It's cousin. Beige. Man, maybe it's towards the bottom. I haven't used it in a while. There it is. Just back in order. And we'll use this. This figure was actually painted around 2002, but it was based in a very primitive way, certainly by today's standards. Speaking of World War II things, I I watched a, view, a video maybe a year ago. This friend of mine who makes videos as well decided to do a book review, and he said something I had never ever heard anyone say. And it was actually a really simple thing, but I never heard anybody say this. And what he said was that his favorite tank of all time was a Sherman tank. And I've never heard anybody say that. Uh, I've heard people say it was the best tank in World War II, won the war, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but not that it was their favorite tank. Um, you 
know, from a modeling aspect, I do want to build some because I think they can have a lot of personality because they're basically drab. There's, they're, they're lots of different variants of them. And they're all, the similarity that they all have is they're pretty unattractive. You know, they're, they're certainly, I would say, the most mass produced tank that is the least attractive. But yeah, that doesn't really matter. Um, you could put all kinds of accoutrements and and gear and stuff on them. You can give them nicknames and stuff like that. But I never heard anybody say that it was their favorite World War II tank. Um, but I would like to do, you know, four to six Shermans. Only one or two of them being 76 millimeter arm ones and just give them some personality. I think it would be pretty cool, but they're not my favorite World War II tank. I mean, not even by a stretch, not even by a, any stretch of the imagination. Doesn't mean they weren't useful. I never heard somebody say that before. Because <laughs> usually people associate favorite stuff with something that looks really, really cool or was really, really, really effective. You know, like the best of its class. You know, one on one, not, not as a whole. So I've never seen anybody, but that's good. It's good for people to have different opinions. Everybody went and died? No. You guys are following. It's okay. Work on your hobbies. I'll just ramble on some more. This is World War II talk today, I guess. But if you're doing stuff at like in the desert, like when they when the Shermans started showing up in the desert, it's a great tank for the desert. I mean. It's 75 millimeter gun is plenty good against, you know, anything except anything in the desert period. And I'm, we're going to put Tunisia in a special case. You know, there was some Tiger 1s that went out there. It's no good against Tiger 1s, but you're not going to encounter a Tiger 1. You're working on lunch. Ah, I wish I could too. I'm hungry. I'm always hungry though. Pretty, pretty much nothing that, that that Sherman can't deal with in the desert. Other than, like I said, a Tiger One. But I already consider I I personally consider Tunisia a separate, like its own thing. I don't think there was any Shermans in the deserts before Alamein. I don't think any of them were used in the battles around Gazala. I think there were some grants at that time. But no Shermans. And the British can take anything American and make it look better, in my opinion. You know, their Shermans look better than American Shermans. Their P-40s look better than American P-40s. 
Although I have a soft spot for the for the P40s, what they look like. But the Kitty Hawks, you know, they put a desert paint scheme on them with the RAF round dome. Made them look better. The Shermans in the desert, they had that swath type of light, dark color. I think it looks, I think they look great. I think it's a good looking vehicle. Um, just like they did with the Crusaders. Honeys. Honeys are a hell of a lot better looking than any Stuarts in any other form. The Honeys. You gave the Sherman a better gun. We're not getting into the Firefly, which is awesome. <laughs> Firefly is awesome. I think everybody likes the Firefly. Except, you know, guys that are in a Panther. <laughs> Yeah. 76 double L. That's a hell of a gun. That's a hell of a gun. Pretty sure all Fireflies had four man crews, right? They ditched the uh, the whole machine gunner. Well, cer certainly Firefly 1s had no, no whole machine gunner. I don't remember if the if the second version of them did, but yeah, that's one hell of a gun. If I remember correctly, it's slightly better than the Panther's gun on AP penetration. The only thing I won't do, and I'll bring this up again, and I bring it up all the time, and I've got Commonwealth stuff for late war. I'm not putting a U.S. star on my Commonwealth stuff. I think it's bullshit. It doesn't look right. <laughs> it just doesn't look right. You know, they didn't put it on every vehicle either, right? Rare credit recognition. So the ones I paint are the ones they didn't put them on them. I got a Firefly. I got a 20 millimeter Firefly from Britannia. The one thing that's really interesting about the British is that the Enfield, I don't know that I've, I've seen something really comparing, in, in both world wars, comparing the Enfield to the, to the Mauser, but the Enfield carries twice as many rounds. It's got a, it's got a, it's got a 10, it's got a 10 round, uh, box i believe it's detachable and the mauser is like a five round in interval i mean i think that would be a huge advantage should be on a tactical level i can't i can't think of another nation that has a 10 round magazine detachable or otherwise for their run-of-the-mill rifle that entire armies aren't equipped with that's you're only reloading twice as often that's that's pretty significant when it's the weapon that everybody is equipped with So, and I play skirmish games. I mean, I've played operational stuff before, but when you play skirmish games, that should be reflected in the game. You know?
I'd say the 17 pounders, in my opinion, the best Allied anti tank weapon of the war. I mean, you got stuff that penetrates more, like the Russian 122 and stuff like that. That takes a freaking year and a half to load one of those things, so to speak. And you know that thing couldn't have been super accurate. You know, you know there was a U.S. 90 millimeter gun. Well, when did those come into effect? After the Bulge, they might have had some Jacksons at the Bulge somewhere. I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that 17 pounder was a better penetrator than the Russian 85. I'd bet money on it. Not that the Russian 85 was that bad around, which it really wasn't, but 17 pounder is definitely the best allied anti tank weapon, in my opinion, of the war. I mean, look at the Germans. The only weapons in any mass numbers that, that, that penetrated more than the Panther's gun, which is similar in performance to the to the seventeen pounder, was the Russian was the um, the Pack forty three that was on the King Tiger. That's it. I mean, yes, they made a one twenty eight. Okay, how many of those were around? Work in the morning. You'll call it a night. Okay, Dirk. Thanks for stopping by. Or you were already on when I was on, so maybe I was the one that stopped by. <laughs> you got to work tomorrow. I don't. Ha ha ha. Labor Day, one of the few days we get off without taking a vacation day here in the United States. It celebrates labor. How do you celebrate it? Not working. <laughs> Logic's a bitch. Yeah, the only the only weapon that the Germans had that had more penetration than that that you even encountered on a regular basis. Not on a regular basis, but not in extreme circumstances, was the 88L71. That was it. The only thing that probably this, this Firefly wasn't great at was probably ammunition capacity. I'm guessing. I'm guessing you couldn't carry that many rounds because of the length of them. I have to look it up. I I got all that data and stuff. I'm just going by you know memory. I'm just I'm rambling here. But probably still carried 50 rounds of it. But you know Panthers carried an absurd amount of rounds. It was a big vehicle. Besides, the Germans had decided to fight the whole damn world at once, so, you know, it's their own fault. <laughs> at least 80 rounds on a Panther, I would imagine.
I'll be right back. Firefly ones definitely didn't have it. I shouldn't say definitely. I'm not reading it out of the book. Didn't have a uh, whole machine gunner because they needed extra ammo space. They still had a coax and probably had an AA, AAMG. So. Hail Sam, there it is. This thing dry yet, by the way? Yeah. Getting there. By the time I'm done with this, we can fool with that again.
it's really nice not to have the Sunday blues when you don't have to work the next day. these guys alone we can put the tufts on them later now they should be pretty much good to go on that let's take a look at this panzer 2 where we're at i think she's dried enough now Do some pin washing with the black. I said you can do this with enamels. I'm not going to do that. It's just a doesn't make that much of a difference. seen some people gloss coat it so it flows a little bit better it doesn't make that much of a difference we don't want to spend a decade doing this did the other tanks and to be honest with you the model was so crude that I really didn't have to do that much Had a lot of resin pockets, a lot of resin bubbles in it. You could do it.
everybody you and I finally see. Three viewers, yes, you made it. Oh, I didn't realize there was something back here. Yeah, that's a problem. I'm gonna mess with that a little later. Oh. I need to lower this a little bit. There we go, all the way down. Okay, I said I don't think I'm going to break and just do World War II stuff with nothing else to do, so. Yeah, we'll do this and then we'll, we'll end up doing a light dry brush on top of it. Just in a couple select areas to bring things up. Oh, man. things are great but they warp sometimes especially when I just wipe like a little area down with some water just enough to that's just enough to, to get them to misbehave all right where did we leave this clown off you got some shoes to do on them there now we got to find all our normal brushes some rope. Do you have a like a buff color for the rope? Yeah, something like this would be fine.
there for his um, the harnesses and stuff on the on the horse. Made in Denmark. The land of Legos. That and those cookies are coming at 10. Which honestly, the 10 is probably more expensive than the cookies. The cookies taste better than the 10, though. Unless you're a goat. Goats eat everything, right? So if go and eat something that's heavily laden with lead, for instance, and then you go and eat the goat, do you get lead poisoning? Does it have ill effects on you? Best way to avoid that is don't eat goat. Something I've been able to handle my entire life. No reason to. Slow Sunday. Very slow Sunday. Okay, I'm gonna call this paint session a go, a uh, uh, goner. So I need to go make coffee, etc. So 
Anyhow, we may be on later on today. 